Support for Carolina Impact comes from our viewers and Wells Fargo. Wells Fargo has donated $390 million Sunny, like I said, you get your own room. to support housing affordability solutions across America. Doing gets it done. Wells Fargo, the bank of doing. This is a production of PBS Charlotte. Just ahead on Carolina Impact. This used to be Eastland Mall. Pretty soon it'll be Eastland Yards. I'm Jeff Sonia with a look back at Eastland's history and an early peek at uh, the future of Charlotte's East Side. Theater Charlotte has been entertaining audiences for nearly a hundred years until it was ravaged by fire. But the show will go on and Carolina Impact is giving you an inside look at the grand reopening. And we meet an extraordinary award-winning children's book illustrator. Carolina Impact starts right now. Carolina Impact, covering the issues, people, and places that impact you. This is Carolina Impact. Good evening, thanks so much for joining us. I'm Amy Burkett. After decades of delays and disappointments, Eastland Mall is finally getting its long-awaited mall makeover. And it could be a game changer for Eastland Mall neighbors, bringing new homes, new jobs, and a new image to Charlotte's east side. Carolina Impact's Jeff Saunier and videographer Doug Stacker show us where they're already moving dirt on Central Avenue. Yeah, we're standing out here right about where the mall itself used to be. You can see what's left of it piled up behind us. But uh, moving dirt out here at Eastland is a big deal, especially for the neighbors after years of no movement at all. Now though, City Hall is partnering with a local developer with lots of experience remaking old malls, doing out here at Eastland what they do best, starting over. So we've got 80 acres of mud right now. But Eastland is such a um, uh, defining name. You know, do you like the name Eastland or don't you? Developer Tim Sidema says it depends on how long you've been here and whether or not you remember Eastland's good old days. First East Coast Food Court, right here. A year-round ice rink, right here at Eastland on Central Avenue. But then came the not-so-good old days. You know the story, Eastland Mall losing its customers, and then losing that Eastland name, and then finally, Eastland wasn't a mall at all. Just an 80-acre east side eyesore, missing out on decades of Charlotte growth that you can actually see off in the distance. Think about the residents here who have been dealing with, you know, uh, failed promises for all those years. And so we walked into that with our eyes open, knowing that this community needed a success and failure was not an option. For Sidema's company, Crosland Southeast, success at Eastland starts with a new take on that old name. Eastland Mall will soon become Eastland Yards. 80 acres of new homes, new businesses, new parks, new everything. Over time, these Eastland drawings have changed, but not the Eastland vision. Because this side is large enough to be transformative to the whole east side. Yeah. You know, as we look over this, you know, almost 80 acres here, what can we do here that could actually invest in the community that could provide community benefits. So this is not our first dead mall redevelopment. You're exactly right. Yep, it turns out what they're building at Charlotte's old Eastland Mall is the same thing they did at Nashville's old Bellevue Center Mall and Richmond's old Cloverleaf Mall. Here we saw a dilapidated mall that was getting worse with every year. It was it was definitely going to go the wrong way and and and, and and like a, like a sickness, it was gonna spread. So, you know, we had to stop that. Once we played, put the flag in, everybody started seeing the vision. In Richmond, that vision is now called Stonebridge. It includes Richmond's largest Kroger grocery store in an area that didn't have a grocery store before, plus new restaurants and new shopping and hundreds of new apartments and condos, all within walking distance. This has been home you know, for the last 36 years. We've never had anything like this in our area. Longtime neighbors in Richmond also love this new volleyball complex in rec center at the old mall. And in Nashville, 
Nashville's hockey team partnered at the Old Mall on this new ice skating center. The cross! And at Eastland, while a deal with Charlotte FC owner David Tepper for an Eastland team headquarters and soccer academy fell through. The Tepper situation was, was a disappointment at the time, but you know where we're at right now, it's exciting. The Charlotte East neighborhood group says Eastland Yards isn't just about turning a profit. It's about turning a corner towards East Charlotte's future. With development too, it's about ensuring that our neighbors, the ones who have really built this community, created this community over the past 20 years in the mall's, the mall's absence or the mall's decline, you know, that their voices are heard too and that, you know, we're not we're not pushing our folks out. But the most important thing that it's gonna bring, it's, it's, it's jobs. It's an economic catalyst for folks that have median paying jobs that they don't have to leave our side of town to get. Many of the residents that have stuck it out for all these years um, have been hoping for something that could be successful here uh, that could create energy and excitement. In fact, some of the future puzzle pieces are already in place, like an Eastland Transit Center, a plan for light rail streetcars in the future, and new schools right next to Eastland. But long timers here add, don't forget Eastland's past either. There's people saying, I ice skated at the Eastland Mall. Um, there were a lot of people that love the name Eastland. We actually also have the original Eastland sun signs. Um, we've been able to track those down and they're all worn and, and broken down, but we're gonna try to re, you know, resurface those and try to you know, restore those into a place of prominence out here if we can. Yep, Eastland's old sun logo, just like Eastland itself, ready to rise again. We've been waiting for a very long time for this, and um, here we are. So it is a piece of our history, and it's a piece of our identity. At the end of the day, I, I believe that it, we can't miss on this. I mean, this is this really. I mean, this is our shot. Crossland Southeast adds that the housing out here at Eastland Yards will offer something for just about everyone. There'll be luxury homes, workforce apartments, and uh, affordable housing for senior citizens. And once they're done moving all this dirt, well, actual buildings will start rising at Eastland Yards later this year, with the entire project uh, finished in about five years. Amy? Thank you so much, Jeff. On our website, you can check out that other mall makeover in Nashville that's already open and similar to Charlotte's Eastland makeover. Just click on the link at pbscharlotte.org. When my now college-age son was just a baby, I loved reading him Sandra Boynton books about barnyard animals. We know how important it is to start reading to children at an early age. Children's books combine images with words to capture the attention of our kids. Picture books can be the start of a lifelong love affair with literature. The author and illustrator team up to create stories that spark the imagination. Producer Russ Hunsinger introduces us to Gordon C. James, an extraordinary local illustrator from Charlotte. I have a life goal to be a great fine artist. That being said, the method in which I work doesn't really change when I'm doing illustrations. I approach my illustration work with the same dedication and passion that I do for the paintings that are just for me. Because I believe that children deserve that in the books that they read. So I try to give kids these beautiful impressionistic paintings 17 to 24 at a time in children's book form. You're leaving a legacy. These books are gonna be around long after I'm dead and gone. I don't want things that are maybe not up to my standards to be out in the world after I'm gone. There's a favorite in literally every one of these. Crown and Ode to the Fresh Cut is a story about a young man who gets a haircut and how good that haircut makes him feel. And so this book won a ton of awards and it's got some beautiful pages in it. I try to figure out in what way that I relate to the character. Sometimes there are things that the character is going through that I've been through like directly in my life, you know? 
And then there are other things that I have to feel like I maybe do a little research on. Also, these books are a team thing. So we have, you know, the editors and the art directors that also help. And I'm Every Good Thing. My favorite one is the cover because my little boy is on it. I just love that one to death. I think my favorite books are the ones that are about present day kids and they're like super uplifting and affirming. I'm Every Good Thing and Crown are very much that way and those are awesome because I have a little boy and a little girl and I like to do those books that, that kind of help kids like Real, that really that boosts that self-esteem or just confirm it. I still do school visits and talks to kids. Oh, they're awesome. I go all over the country and it's just fun. A lot of times it's the entire school and I have a PowerPoint presentation and I bring people up. We design a book cover together. We create stories together. I'll talk to kids about their drawings and and why I'm doing what I'm doing and what they could maybe do if they feel like going in this direction. When you get out and you get to see the people who you created the book for and that they enjoy it, it is just a blast. What I would like to leave people with is that if you have a passion, it could be you know a creative passion, an intellectual pursuit, whatever it is, it's something that you deserve to have in your life. A lot of people have this thing that's inside them that they want to do and they just don't give themselves the right to do it or they don't carve out the time to do it. Meanwhile, they get up every day and they go to a job and they do their absolute best and then they come home and they don't give any of that energy to themselves. So I would like to encourage people to give some of that energy to yourself and um, feed your passion and just take those steps into being that person that you know you are destined to be. You can find a link to more of his work on our Carolina Impact page at pbscharlotte.org. Theater Charlotte is Carolina's longest running community theater. In 2020, it suffered back-to-back -back blows, leaving the venue facing its final curtain. The show would go on thanks to an outpouring of community support. Three years later, the nonprofit is reopening the doors, and as Carolina Impact's Rochelle Metzger shows us, its homecoming season kicks off with something rotten. The cast of Something Rotten may be singing about the Renaissance, a place where everything is new, but they could also be talking about the building they're performing in. Kelly Wright is part of the ensemble and the first group to rehearse in Theatre Charlotte's newly renovated auditorium. It has been a workout and uh, a challenge, but it, it's so much fun. It is such a funny show. It is so high energy. This cast is insanely talented. Okay, so Joe just took his bow. We had eight counts to come Lisa down. Lisa Blanton is the show's choreographer. I think we're kind of at a renaissance to reference the show, but there are just a lot of talented, talented young performers who are new to Charlotte. It's so exciting for me to get to work with them. Theater Charlotte is the longest running community theater in North Carolina. Blanton says it's because audiences know they're going to see professional level performances. It's just a big, huge musical theater extravaganza. <laughs> so it's super fun. The nonprofit has been a pillar in the city's arts and entertainment landscape for nearly a century. Dennis Delamar has been involved as an actor and director since 1983. Stop it, stop it. The theater faced its toughest year in 2020, first with COVID-19, as Delamar vividly remembers. He was directing a production of Cat on a Hot Tin Roof. We were five days from opening March 13th, Friday the 13th, 2020. The world shut down, and so did our show. And then came a devastating fire. That was a very scary night. Diana Wakefield chairs the board of directors. On December 28, 2020, an electrical fire broke out overnight. She says the damage was extensive. Our auditorium floor, stage damage, seating, all our sound and light equipment. And people don't seem to realize that when there's a fire, the smoke damage is invasive. 
Wakefield says they had to replace ceiling tiles, carpet, and furniture too. But the days that followed, we had no idea if we would ever be able to be back here, or if we did, what it would take, and if the community would support us enough to get back in this building. The community did step up to help, as did patrons and other arts organizations. Determined the show would go on, the theater hit the road, staging productions at venues around the city, all the while raising funds to rebuild. I did a um, production of Falsettos, the musical. It was a staged reading that we held last March um, that served as a fundraiser for, for the space. Wright says when she finally saw the new space with its grand stage, plush seats and new equipment, she was brought to tears. At our meet and greet, which was the first time I walked in, I wept. <laughs> um, I was, it was very emotional. It's taken three years, but Theater Charlotte has returned to its longtime home at 501 Queens Road, just in time to kick off its 95th season with the musical Something Rotten. Go see a musical. Something Rotten is about two playwrights um, who are competing with Shakespeare in the Elizabethan era to make the biggest show possible, the next big hit. Um, and these two playwrights come out with the world's first musical. Brianna Mayo is new to the Queen City and says she chose to audition for Theatre Charlotte because of its stellar reputation. Did my research and everyone raved about the shows they did, but also the people, and that's really what I was looking for. For Mayo's first show, she's part of the ensemble. You know, kind of hearing that applause, hearing that laughter and the cheers, um, it's going to be really meaningful and a sign of, you know, all the work we put into it. I think anybody coming to something rotten is going to have a heck of a good time. I hate Shakespeare! I think by now we sort of know you hate Shakespeare! It is absolutely silly in the cleverest ways. Some musicals have no talking at all. For decades, the volunteer-driven community theater has been staging revivals of musicals and plays. I smile and take a breath and say, we did it, we're back. You could say Pat Heist is the unofficial historian, a beloved patron. She's been involved with Theater Charlotte since the 60s. Her first production was called Sound of Murder. She went on to perform in dozens of shows, including Pajama Game, Guys and Dolls and Steel Magnolias. The dressing rooms were certainly different. The green room was different. So we've come a long way, making it a little more comfortable, bigger. The organization that would become Theater Charlotte was founded back in 1927. The troupe moved to its permanent home on Queens Road in 1941. Since then, it's been a second home for hundreds of actors, stagehands, volunteers, and lovers of the theater. That a lot of the people that have been on this stage who have gone on to New York, on to Broadway, or have gone on to do wonderful things in whatever they're doing, whether they're working on set design or makeup or costuming, that have gone on and they all started right here in Charlotte. Heiss says no matter the decade, the smell of the theater and the feeling you get on stage never changes. The nonprofit wants more young people to experience that feeling. It plans to restart the Student Theater Guild this summer and expand outreach to local schools. There's a song from a show that I did called Follies. And it goes, good times and bum times. I've seen them all and my dear, I'm still here. That's the theme song for Theater Charlotte. <laughs> She's still here. And the future for this beloved community playhouse is as bright as the stars that grace its stage. For Carolina Impact, I'm Rochelle Metzger. Thank you so much, Rochelle. From local premieres to classic favorites, seven shows are planned for season 95. Something Rotten runs through February 5th, followed by productions of Misery in March and Pippin in April. We've put a link to the 2023 performance schedule and volunteer opportunities with Theatre Charlotte on our website at pbscharlotte.org. Deciding what college to attend is a huge decision for any high schooler. What if some of the best colleges in the nation wanted you to attend their university and on a full athletic scholarship?
That's the decision facing Charlotte Catholic basketball player Blanca Thomas. But as Carolina Impact's Jason Terzis found out, this terrific teen isn't the only one in her family to play the game at a super high level. It's the question Blanca Thomas gets asked most often. All the time. And the answer to that question? Six at five. Wait, what did she just say? Six at five. That's what I thought she said. Pretty sure now you can guess what that question is. I used to get annoyed, but like, I mean, at this point, it doesn't bother me at all. It's just like another question, like, what's your name? Turns out height is something that runs in the Thomas family. 5'11". Shoes on, I say 6'1", shoes on. 6'4". 6'6". Like, when we're all together, like, walking around as a family, everyone's always looking at us, like, all the time. When it comes to athletics, the Thomases have put their height to good use, especially when it comes to basketball. One more. Hey! Mom Tatiana was the tallest on her high school team in New Jersey. Uh, I was center. Dad John played on his high school team in Wisconsin. As I joke now with my kids, I was a highly recruited Division III athlete. John and Tatiana have three children. Colin was team captain at Charlotte Catholic a couple years ago. I was all conference sophomore year and then was all conference again senior year. Number 30, Vaughn Thomas. Vaughn is a senior starting guard on this year's Cougars team. Basketball is so fun, like I love like I love the games. And Blanca, a junior, is the starting center on the girls team. If I was gonna play a sport, it was gonna be basketball or volleyball because of like the height thing. Together, the Thomases are one big basketball family. It's been interesting because I think it's like created a bond for all of us because we all have like this common experience, which is cool. I mean, I think the kids discount Tatiana and I's basketball experience, like, you know, they think that was like forever ago. And at one point we did, it was like JV boys, when Vaughn was on JV boys, Blank was on Varsity Girls, and Colin was on Varsity Boys. So it was like, we, it was a, an all day event. It's a family affair. They're here for the whole night and, uh, you know, they're some of our best fans. But seeing all those games in person isn't always easy, especially for John, who works in Charleston and makes the three hour drive back to Charlotte twice a week to see his kids play. I put 37 thousand miles on my car a year, so, um, and most of it comes during basketball season. But I wouldn't change it for anything, believe me. While the games have been fun for the whole family, it's Blanca who's been turning the heads of college coaches around the country. Because COVID is when I decided to really like work on myself and like work on how good I could be. Blanca didn't care about basketball. Like she would have never worked out, never played outside, nothing that she realized, I'm kind of good at this, I'm getting looked at, and then she realized like she started taking it seriously basically. I mean, I found the love for it. Like I actually was starting to enjoy it and like that was something that I knew I wanted to do. Coaching girls basketball here for a long time, so she's the most skilled I've ever seen at that size. She was uh, unanimous conference player of the year as a freshman. Ranked as a top 10 prospect nationwide in the class of 24, it's no surprise college coaches are in the stands at all of Blanca's games. On this particular night, Duke head coach and former U.S. Olympic gold medalist Carol Lawson was in the crowd. The first person to ever reach out to me was Michigan actually, which I was obviously in shock because this Michigan being your first call is pretty crazy. Some of these schools will they'll get on a plane, fly down here for, you know, a, hour and a half game, get back on a plane, fly back. I would say for a big, I'm very like agile and I'm good on my feet. Like you don't really find a lot of centers who can run the floor as fast as I can or like have like the footwork and can do all that. Blanca's first college scholarship offer came during her freshman season. Then it really started snowballing. And then there was this one week where I got like five offers like back to back. And because it's like, it's just one after one after the other. But now she just has like so many, like going all, on, on all these visits. I mean, it's so cool to see. I think Blanca has shown like an unbelievable level of maturity through it. It's been an amazing, amazing journey. With so many schools recruiting her and offering her a full ride scholarship, Blanca narrowed her list down to 10 this past summer. South Carolina, Tennessee, Stanford, Michigan, North Carolina, Duke, NC State, Virginia Tech, who are the other two? Oh, Notre Dame, and, oh, and Louisville. There you go. She's trying to enjoy the recruiting process, as coaches do all they can to win over her services. She was in Knoxville this fall, when Tennessee upset Alabama in football and rushed the field, along with tens of thousands of others. Blanca and I started, and Tatiana started last year we started doing some visits and then once Blanca has kind of narrowed it down to the 10 we've really been focused on going back visiting those schools and now we've really been prioritizing this year 
going to games on campus to get a feel for what it's really like. Her bedroom walls are filled with some of the cool things each school's graphic design departments have sent her, and their shoe boxes filled with stuff. So my favorite part is, is getting the mail because a lot of the coaches take the time and like write personalized letters to you. Michigan loves to do these like puzzle ones with my face on them. So like you kind of like put it together. But when it gets right down to it, talking with current players at each program will likely have the biggest influence on what College Blanca ultimately chooses. That's gonna be a big thing for me when I come to make that decision that I ask the players on what their opinions are and like how they like their experience there because I want to go somewhere where I have a good relationship with the coach, but I also want the players to enjoy like the environment that they're in. Because that, she says, will tell her the real inside story and go a long way in helping her decide. For Caroline Impact, I'm Jason Terzis reporting. Such extraordinary athletes. Thanks so much, Jason, for bringing us that story. As for that big decision, Blanca says she's hoping to make it by the summer. Before we say goodnight, I want to thank our wonderful studio audience who joined us from Pineville Parks and Recreation. Well, that's all the time we have this evening. Thanks so much for joining us. We always appreciate your time, and we look forward to seeing you back here again next time on Carolina Impact. Good night, my friends. Production of PBS Charlotte. Support for Carolina Impact comes from our viewers and Wells Fargo. Wells Fargo has donated $390 million Sunny, like I said, you get your own room. to support housing affordability solutions across America. Get it, get it. Doing gets it done. Wells Fargo, the bank of doing.